Good afternoon. I'm going to introduce you to the network knowledge area of the Cyborg Initiative. My name is Sanjay Jha. I'm a professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and uh, uh, my teaching and research interests are in security, particularly at the intersection of network and security. So uh, the roadmap for this presentation is as follows. I'll go through the introduction, very briefly describe the internet architecture that will help us understand uh, the whole distributed systems and various components and how everything fit together. Uh, then look at network protocols and some vulnerabilities. Um, given that I'm taking this layered model approach in this talk, so I'll go through each of the internet uh, layers, five layers of architecture from application transport network link. Um, actually, I won't go to the lowest uh, physical layer, but we'll talk about some wireless and security. I think physical layer is covered in other KAs. Uh, I'll very briefly skim through network defense tools because it intersects with networking, but I believe it also has been covered in another um, KA in details. And uh, then finally, I'll conclude with a quick overview of a couple of interesting advanced networking topics like SDN and IoT. So we'll start our discussions with the internet. Uh, given that all of us use internet, we know how vulnerable and insecure it is. And uh, it gives us a good segue into the network securities associated with the dominant uh, internet working technology. Uh, because of our heavy reliance on the technology, if uh, a malicious actor can um, interrupt the network or the services, we won't be able to function today with our day-to-day -day lives in terms of how we work, how we use IoT devices and other things which are all connected to the internet. So um, a little bit of history. Originally when the internet protocols were designed, that is to transport packets around the network, um, security was not a major concern. So a lot of these protocols did not have security in their design. Uh, but in past uh, couple of decades, we have started to see how the network security has become so prominent, especially that internet became commercial in 90s, uh, and a lot of electronic transactions, e-commerce and stuff is happening. So uh, we'll look at some of the protocols uh, in that context and see um, how security has been added to these protocols later on. So what are we trying to attempt today is to explore the challenges in securing a network which could be under a range of attacks. Uh, we'll look at uh, the widely used security protocols which are currently um, deployed in various networking scenarios. And we'll look at uh, some emerging security challenges and the uh, proposed solutions itself cat and mouse came that we come up with solutions and then new attacks are found. So that makes the field quite challenging and interesting. Uh, I must say that um, in order to understand or appreciate this talk, one would need some basic uh, understanding of networking protocol and TCP IP search. And I presume that uh, the, re the viewers have that information. Uh, the the KA has reference to some texts. If you are not sure, you can refer to those texts. If you look at the internet, it runs distributed applications which can be running over a range of networking technologies. And uh, the whole complex network and the client-server architecture can be easily understood through layered architecture. Uh, that's very common that if you have a complex task, you use a layered approach to break it into smaller chunks and then try to understand each of them. And that's what uh, folks in networking have done for a long period of time. So originally, when the networking was evolving, there was a seven layer ISO OSI protocol stack. And uh, later on, as the internet became popular, um, that became a five layer protocol stack, also popularly known as TCP IP stack. So if we move on to the next fall, I'll show you the major difference between the two stack. Uh, one of the reasons we are looking at this architecture is that it allows us to break the whole 
big task into smaller pieces and look at each of these sections, that is the layers, uh, to see what kind of uh, security issues arise, how they are uh, being handled by protocols and other mechanisms. So in this picture, we are going to have a look at the seven layer architecture that you may have seen in many networking courses. Basically, you have a client connected over a communication network, talking to a server, and uh, the seven layer includes uh, application presentation, session transport network, and link and physical layers. So this was the original OSI model, but later internet removed this presentation and session layers and went for a leaner five layer architecture because uh, there was a lot of overhead and the decision was that applications can choose the functions of presentation and session layer as they wish and that can be embedded in the application. So not to mandate every single application using these layers. Uh, one of the other reasons why we want to understand these layers is that when you are protecting any sort of uh, um, distributed systems, you want to know the interfaces, how they communicate. And so this layered model gives us a nice sort of way of starting to understand the whole security. When we are talking about security, we will be talking about network vulnerabilities. And uh, in order to assess a network vulnerability, we need to define adversarial attacking models. And in literature, if you look at li research literature primarily, then they use uh, a very prominent work by Dolev Yao, and uh, they are used for formal analysis of security protocols. So in this model, Basically, you are looking at an adversary who's very strong, can do a whole range of things like uh, can read messages, prevent delivery of any message, duplicate message, and so forth. Uh, whereas uh, the real adversaries may have limited capabilities. So if we are doing network vulnerability analysis, then for each application scenario, we may look at more realistic choices. But when we write papers, certainly there is expectation to look at the worst case scenario. So in order to understand the security attacks, we'll use the popular characters that you read in different papers or books, um, Alice, Bob, and the malicious actors like Eve and Mallory. So the simplest example usually is to look at, say, Alice and Bob. They wish to exchange messages securely. And then you have actors like Eve, who is eavesdropping, can get all the messages. Or Mallory is a malicious attacker who could um, sit between Alice and Bob and try to compromise their communication. Now, in real world, you would have uh, basically uh, web servers and clients replacing Alice and Bob, and uh, there could be other type of servers like DNS and mail clients. So uh, in terms of Eve, basically Eve can capture the traffic uh, uh, she can extract uh, confidential information, uh, things like, uh, say, passwords or credit card details if uh, we are looking at e-commerce type application. Um, in case of Mallory, can launch a man-in-the-middle attack whereby they can place between Alice and Bob, capture information, try to alter information. Again, uh, in real world, these devices could be like gateways, routers, access points, or uh, sometimes malware present in a user device. So there are a number of network security attacks. Uh, we are not able to really go through all of them, but uh, let's have a look at a couple of them to start with. So first of all, uh, denial of service attack, which you would have heard pretty much comes in the media almost every day whereby an attacker can send an avalanche of uh, bogus packets to a server so that server is busy or gets choked processing these packets and the genuine users who want to communicate with the server will not get their packets through, which means they won't be getting the service. Now, even the extended version of this attack is called DDoS, which is Distributed Denial of Service Attack. In this case, a whole range of bots or different devices are basically drafted into attacking a particular server. So the attack comes from many, many 
directions in the network and come from different networks and they're harder to block. Uh, one of the popular examples is the Mirai attack, DDoS attack, which was launched in 2016, where the IoT device like IP camera were captured and uh, they were made bots and then they started to attack uh, a particular server. Now, what they do is that typically they would exploit certain weaknesses uh, and a very typical one is weak authentication whereby some of the devices routers and all are configured with uh, default passwords, one, two, three, four admin and so forth. Um, then you have another type of attack which is called IP spoofing attack. And uh, in this case, uh, attacker can try to impersonate by crafting a packet where the IP address is uh, replaced with a genuine user's IP address, and that makes it uh, look real and uh, can succeed in attacking or getting its packet and receive some response from a server. If we're looking at security of any system, there are certain desirable properties, and that also uh, relates to secure communication. So the first item here is confidentiality, which means like uh, if you're sending something, it should be received and understood by only an intended receiver in case of networking sometimes. Uh, it's hard to do that, but uh, the important point is that even if someone gets the message, they should not be able to figure out what the message is. The second part is authentication. So when you're communicating, you saw the client server picture. Basically, you want to make sure that the two parties know who they are talking to. So if you're buying some product from Amazon, for example, you know that you're talking to Amazon server, you have not been directed to a bogus server. Now, message integrity is uh, another very important aspect. And it's a bit different from confidentiality in that you want to make sure that you have received the message and it has not been altered somewhere in the middle by a malicious actor. So for example, we were talking about Mallory, which can put themselves in between the sender and receiver and can change the message. So we need to make sure that we have mechanisms whereby we can maintain the message integrity. Then we have non-repudiation. And uh, this is quite important because we are doing a lot of commerce transactions and other transactions. We want to make sure that if a transaction has happened, then the party cannot deny that the message was not sent by the sender, for example. And we'll come back to that later in a more detailed example. And then finally, access and availability. Uh, as we saw with denial of service attack, we can attack a server, make it uh, impossible for legitimate users to use. So that's a very important property of a system whereby you want to design it in such a way that access and availability um, requirements or service level requirements are met for the users. So we are going to go back to the layered architecture and start looking at application layer security. And a use case would be that, say, Alice and Bob want to use email. Now, basically, if they want to achieve the properties that we discussed earlier, then they may decide to use some sort of symmetric key encryption algorithm. And again, this symmetric key, asymmetric key has been discussed in um, the crypto K. So if you're not sure, you may like to have a quick look at that K. And uh, so AES is one of the uh, popular standard algorithms these days. Um, and uh, for the sake of argument, you can use 256 bit key, but typically the, kids, uh, the keys are a bit longer. So Alice encrypts the message and sends it to Bob uh, for uh, um, using some sort of uh, mechanism, say they agree on a key. So Bob can decrypt the message using the same shared key. So by using this symmetric key, now what have they achieved? First of all, message can be decrypted by Alice and Bob achieving confidentiality because say if they're using the key, no one else um, assuming that the key has not been leaked, uh, no one else will be able to decipher the message. Even if they somehow get the message, they won't be able to make sense of what it is. However, we got to be careful that it is not achieving certain other properties. For example, uh, there is no integrity check. So even if you encrypt, 
say Mallory can capture this information and alter certain bits um, and send it uh, to Bob. I don't think in this case Bob is able to um, detect that something has been altered because there is no integrity provided. And we'll talk about how this can be achieved later on. Let's go back to the application layer security. Um, this is uh, the top layer from the five layer of internet architecture that we saw earlier. And the example would be that Alice and Bob want to use email and they want to achieve the security properties. Uh, let's say that they decide to use symmetric key encryption and they pick up AES uh, standard. Again, if you're not sure, just uh, please uh, refer to the crypto K. And in this example, they take 256-bit key. Typically, the keys will be longer. So Alice encrypts the message and sends it to Bob, who can decrypt using the same shared key, and Bob can do the same. He can send message to Alice and encrypt and decrypt. So what have we achieved by doing this? Both Alice and Bob are able to achieve confidentiality because these two people have keys and they encrypt so no one else can read the message. However, they have not received uh, any integrity check because someone can alter the message in the middle. With, even though they can't understand it, they can replace the bits and there's no way that Alice and Bob can find out. Uh, origin authentication is not taking place because Alice and Bob, like client and server, are over the network. And because there has been no step to authenticate it, they don't really know who they are talking to. So we need additional methods to achieve certain properties. And uh, in this example, we assume that magically somehow they have uh, the shared key. But in reality, we'll require some method of key distribution, uh, especially if we are looking at a large number of devices in big organizations. Uh, let's. Uh, change this example to slightly different objective where Bob and Alice don't care about confidentiality. They want to make sure that uh, the message comes with integrity check. That is like no one can alter it in the middle. So Alice, say for example, before sending the message would calculate a message hash using one of the available algorithms. And SHA-3, for example, is uh, one of the algorithms which can give you message hash. And uh, this message is sent to Bob along with the hash. So now what Bob can do is run the hash algorithm. This is a standard algorithm and see if the hash that he has calculated is matching what he has received or not. And that tells Bob that message has been altered or has not been altered. So again, in this case, we are not worried about confidentiality or origin authentication. Uh, this brings an interesting sort of perspective that uh, when you look at applications, not every application wants every single property. For example, if you're reporting temperature from sensors in a room, uh, you may not be too worried about, say, the confidentiality, but you want to make sure that the readings are reported correctly. So you may have built just the integrity function or authentication to make sure that, yes, it is coming from the sensor that you have deployed. Now, as we saw that we did not provide any confidentiality or authentication, so even with the integrity, the trouble is that if this message is passing via network, an attacker can easily capture the message, replace the original message with a bogus message, forged message, and then cal calculate a new hash and send it to Bob. Now, Bob will check and things will pass, and Bob will have no idea whether it's coming from Alice and it's the message she sent or it's been altered. So as you can see, like we need some additional mechanisms to make sure that um, our system is secure. So let's look at uh, a new situation. That's the case C here. Now Alice can calculate the message hash using SHA-3 algorithm. And additionally, she will be using a pre-negotiated symmetric key as we did in the very first case A, to encrypt the hash. Now, Bob can decrypt this hash using pre-negotiated symmetric key. So what have we achieved by using these two mechanisms? 
Um, we still have not achieved confidentiality. Maybe that's not a, the objective. So we did encrypt the message. We sent the message in plain text. In terms of integrity, yes, we use SHA-3. So Bob can verify the integrity of the received message. Not only that, this also authenticates that the message was sent by someone who has knowledge of the shared key that Bob is using. And since this key was used by or negotiated with Alice, so Bob can be reasonably assured that uh, the message is coming from Alice and it provides uh, authentication. We are assuming that in this case, um, key has not been compromised, obviously. However, it does not provide non-repudiation. Uh, the reason for that is that there is no registration of this key with the legal authority. So how do you make sure that if this matter goes to the court, then you can prove that the key that was used was uh, assigned to Alice? And we'll see that we need some additional mechanism to achieve that objective. So there is another scheme called public key cryptography. In previous files, we assumed that we were using symmetric key, which means both parties had same key. So in, in public key cryptography, again, uh, the crypto K would have more details on it. Uh, each party would have a pair of keys, like public key and private key. And uh, the public key is registered with some public authority. We'll talk a bit more about that later. So in this case, Alice will use the public key cryptography and calculate the message hash using SHA-3 algorithm. And then she will use her private key to encrypt the hash. In previous case, we were using only symmetric key, okay? So this forms what we call also digital signature. So Bob now describes this hash using Alice's public key. And uh, we'll talk about this issue later as to how Bob can get Alice's public key. So what have they achieved? No confidentiality, again, like because maybe that's not the objective of this application, so we still send it in plain text. Integrity check, yes, because we are using SHA-3. Authentication, yes, because uh, we know that uh, this is Alice's key because she's used her private key. Also, it uses, uh, provides non-repudiation as well because we know that uh, Alice is the only person who can have this key because she has registered with some authority and obtained um, this key, or, or got certified that uh, this private key is matching a public key which is registered with an authority. So the other feature we achieved is that we avoided pre-negotiation of shared keys. Like earlier, we assumed that Alice and Bob somehow have negotiated the shared key. Maybe they went to a cafeteria and exchange or on a piece of paper somewhere they hid and the other party picked up that key. So all of that is not required here. Now, one of the possibilities here is that uh, when we are using this public key and private key, that an attacker could impersonate and pretend to be Alice or Bob and they could pretend to be using their key. And there is a chance that uh, um, man in the middle attack can be launched. So um, this uh, brings the question of how do we make sure that uh, if we are, say, decrypting a message um, which belongs to Alice and um, she has used her private key, then the public key is her public key, not someone else's. So that brings us to uh, the topic of public key infrastructure. and. Basically, this provides a solution whereby um, entities like users, servers, organizations can register their key with a certified authority. These authorities have registered with some government agencies before they can start distributing these keys. And uh, the users can then provide certain documents, et cetera, and uh, obtain the keys. So typically a user's identity, the public key, and the certification authorities information are used into a hash function. And then that hash is signed with the CA's private key to produce a public key certificate. This is similar to the example we saw earlier with the email exchange, except that now CA is using its uh, uh, private key 
and now CA has registered its key with some government agency in the hierarchy to make sure that um, that's credible. So there are many fields uh, on the certificate and uh, they include like unique identifier, a serial number, um, whatever signature algorithm they are using and uh, also provides uh, expiry date as to how long this certificate is going to be valid. So Bob can get the PKC for Alice from a CA and apply CA's public key to retrieve Alice's public key. So that way Bob is assured that uh, this key is belonging to Alice and it's registered with a CA. So this is the kind of mechanism a lot of servers and clients do. Um, in many cases, uh, these keys could be pre-installed in the operating systems or browser. And uh, if some unknown keys uh, appear, then there are mechanisms in PKI to verify those keys. And that brings some challenges. Later on, we'll see that, in fact, the PKI structure itself can be insecure. Interestingly, there are other ways of uh, providing this uh, PKI. So you, you have something called Web of Trust, whereby users can create a community of trusted parties by mutually signing certificates without needing a proper registrar that we saw in the previous case. So Alice and Bob can sign each other certificates certifying their public keys. And when other entities are going to use the system, if they trust Alice, um, they can use both cert certificate duly certified by Alice, for example. So, and this can be extended as a chain to many other users. So one of the applications called PGP, pretty good privacy, uh, was one of the earliest uh, email program or system, and uh, they use this web of trust for certificates. So that's an interesting approach that is worth knowing. So as I was saying earlier, the PKI model that has been prevalent and it still is, has its own problems. Um, there have been issues where certifying authorities or certificate authorities have issued certificates in error or under course and or sometimes their databases have been compromised. So um, recent years have seen several uh, solutions being proposed. We a bit advanced topic for this uh, talk. Uh, I would uh, suggest uh, looking at some of the references. So uh, many systems are using things like uh, certificate pinning. That is, say for example, when you're doing SSL communication, somehow how, how do you start to uh, verifying the certificates and um, sometimes the defaults can be overridden because uh, they are not very secure. Uh, there is another new direction where people are looking at public immutable logs. And this is driven by blockchain because in blockchain community, people are using PKI and blockchain can provide a publicly immutable logs. So they're trying to build PKI structure using blockchain. Again, there are references that uh, the viewers may like to refer to. So when we started uh, our discussion, I said that we'll look at number of security protocols. And I did say that when the internet started, security was not the main concern. In fact, getting a message from one terminal to another terminal was considered to be a big achievement. So. Um, protocols were developed to achieve basic functions, and now that internet is commercial, uh, security has become a major challenge. So a lot of protocols initially, like SMTP, um, were for uh, mail exchanges between servers, and they were prone to those and impersonation attack. DNS, as you know, like there are a lot of attacks. I'm not going to go into details. You can read uh, it in the KA, but there are different type of attacks, like man in the middle attack or the cache poisoning, cache exfiltration, and um, this is a huge challenge. HTTP initially did not provide any security, and uh, there were many types of DOS attacks possible. Network time protocol used for synchronizing clocks on different machines uh, on a network um, also is prone to all different type of attacks like replay, spoofing DOS, and so forth. So I encourage you to look at the K and some of the references there. 
And uh, again, like it's not real important to memorize any of these things, but uh, I guess it gives you uh, a glimpse into how like uh, the protocols originally were designed without security and later on uh, security was added. So anytime you see a word S, uh, sorry, a letter S at the end of the acronym, that suggests that the new security services have been implemented. So MIME has S MIME, DNS has DNSSEC, and uh, then HTTP has HTTPS now, like most of you would be using that. And NTP has uh, many mechanisms for implementing authentication, authorization, etc. Okay, so now we'll have a look at the layer, the layer application layer that's called transport layer. Earlier we saw that uh, we could implement security mechanisms at application layer, but in this case, like every application has to take care of its own security. So uh, if we could implement security at transport layer, then the burden of implementing many security mechanisms can be relieved from applications and it will be a lot easier for application developers to focus on developing application features. So a uh, shim layer, which is, uh, if you're looking at the protocol stack, um, it was implemented between the application and transport layer called SSL, and stand for secure socket layer. So many of you who are familiar with networking would know the socket program, which provides a door into the OS for writing applications uh, from data. So there are application programming interface now provided by SSL uh, that enables applications to start a secure connection and send and receive data securely. So it's performing the function of sending data over transport layer, but now it is doing securely. And uh, IET has developed a protocol called TLS. TLS basically borrows ideas from SSL. So SSL went through several versions, one, two, three, and so forth. And um, TLS is uh, heavily like reliant on the development on in SSL 3.0. So in order to have a quick grasp, I'm not going to make you an expert on SSL. It's a, it's a kind of involved protocol, and um, there is a bit of description in the KA. But obviously, if you're going to work deeply in the protocol, then you might find some network security texts, which will have a lot of details, or you can go through RFCs. So there are typically three phases of the SSL. Um, obviously, you have TCP three-way handshake that uh, you would be familiar with the TCP protocol. And after that, a bunch of client and server hello messages are exchanged. In, in the next four, like there are descriptions of exactly what each of them do. But essentially, the clients and server are talking to each other, saying what security capabilities they have, what are the algorithms they can use for encryption and integrity check. In the mix, they throw some nonce, et cetera, to make sure that uh, forward secrecy can be maintained. And after they both have negotiated and generated a certain number of keys, we'll talk about the keys later, then the actual application data from user is going to go through this encryption process. So the keys that have been used for integrity check and encryption will be used. So I'm not going to read through these faults. I'll uh, let the viewers go through it in their own time. But basically, you will find that uh, they're actually negotiating the security parameters that will be used. And then they move on to generate certain keys. So I'll spend a few minutes on um, this key generation, because that's very interesting. So typically, a pseudo random function produces a master secret, MS. Okay. And uh, that uses the client nonce, that's uh, a large integer typically, a server nonce, and pre master secret PMS. So uh, basically, the pre master secret is sort of a shared key. Now, you would have to use certain protocols to negotiate that. And say, for the sake of argument, Defi Hellman protocol, again, just uh, refer to the crypto KA, if you're not sure, could be used so that the two parties can negotiate a shared key over the network. And that happens uh, as a popular choice in SSL, in fact. So once this is uh, combined with those uh, clients and servers, nonce, et cetera, um, the master key is uh, going to be used to derive four different keys. 
Okay, and we are not going to go into details, but you can check what are some of the additional parameters. So one key is client encryption key, and that is to be used for encrypting data from Bob to Alice in this example. The second is uh, for the reverse direction of traffic. So whatever is coming from Alice to Bob, you encrypt that. And then you have a separate MAC key, um, which will be to calculate MAC for uh, data sent from Bob to Alice and vice versa. So this is a fairly important feature and uh, it's used in many protocols. Uh, because it allows to generate these ephemeral keys for encryption and integrity in each direction. And that achieves what is called perfect power secrecy. So say, for example, uh, if a man in the middle of attack is happening and someone is capturing everything which is happening in this session, and they want to do a replay attack, so in future they want to really try to use the same set of keys. Somehow if they manage to tear out the keys, or replay the same packets, they won't uh, succeed because for every session, a new nonce will be generated. And so the keys will fail. They will not match the keys for that particular session. So, so that's another important uh, feature of security that you achieve by doing this kind of uh, extensive key generation process. Viewers who are familiar with uh, TCP protocol would know that TCP is a stream-oriented protocol. So it, Keep sending continuous number of bytes. Now, how do you do integrity check? Where do you stop? Because if you wait too long to accumulate a certain amount of data, you're introducing an additional delay. So uh, TLS has provided uh, a, a format whereby you can send variable length of data and basically it tells in the field that what is the length of this particular um, uh, packet, for example, and uh, or record, if you like and um, then a MAC is appended at the end of it. Sometimes padding, et cetera, can be used depending on block cipher that is to give a certain size. So that way you can use variable length of data and depending on your uh, application requirements, you can keep sending things rather than waiting for uh, too much information to be gathered. Now at the beginning we said that we will be looking at various types of attacks. So um, TCP uh, or the transport layer security comes with many different type of attacks. Uh, TCCP SYN flooding is like choking a server by sending too many uh, SYN packets during the handshake. And because each SYN creates a state in a server, it takes a memory and the server won't be able to do anything useful. So there are mechanisms like TP, TCP cookies, which is quite cool and I recommend reading this RFC. Um, there are other type of attacks like a connection replay. And uh, there is a whole range of attack on SSL. Um, it's called SSL streaming based and lucky 13, etc. So you may like to uh, refer to some of these if this topic interests you. Um, in fact, in SSL stripping, what they do is simply completely remove the SSL. So um, they replace the headers so the, the receiver wouldn't even know that SSL has been used. Uh, there are many faults and found uh, uh, many vulnerabilities and, and over different generations, the protocol has been made more robust. So we come to a new protocol called Quick. Um, this is coming from Google. And as you know that TCP has a lot of overhead, it's a connection oriented protocol, so you have to maintain state and check various things, so it slows down things. And it was designed earlier when the network used to be slow, there were a lot of errors and problems. So in new generation of uh, network, like when you have a lot of optical fast networks, the uh, error rates are very low, uh, TCP can become a bottleneck. So Google has come up with Quick and they are using it UDP instead uh, over HTTP. They have used a bunch of proprietary protocols, but at the point of writing, it appears that they are leaning towards uh, TLS 1.3. Um, as far as uh, the firewalls and all go, um, they don't uh, look at this protocol. It's not standard because it's using standard HTTP port. Uh, it's just worth knowing that these kind of new developments are happening. Ha having looked at the transport layer now, let's uh, come down to the next layer, which is network layer. So one question may arise as to why do we need now, network layer security, if we already done security at transport layer or even at application layer. 
So we did justify why we need transport layer so that all applications can use it. But the higher layer mechanisms do not necessarily protect an organization's internal network, which means that uh, by the time they detect if any attack has happened, it's too late. Already the damage has been done. That's one. Secondly, irrespective of whatever mechanisms you do, you cannot conceal the IP headers, which means an attacker can see where the information is coming, where it's going, and so forth. So basically, we will look at the security mechanisms at network layer, which supports virtual private network over the internet. Now, this is uh, reasonably popular these days because many organizations are using VPNs. I think it's good as a network security professional to get a bit of insight into how this can be achieved. So in the internet, uh, IPsec is basically a set of recommendation standards, RFCs, which looks at the security at network layer. And uh, we'll try to go through an example. So in this example, you have an enterprise network which has uh, IP compliant, IPsec compliant, I should say, gateway router. And uh, this organization enterprise allows its employee to work from home, but they want to make sure that uh, everything is secure. So in this picture, like you have an IPsec compliant host and uh, say they are using their home network, the IP compliant host, IPsec compliant host is going to encapsulate everything using IPsec header and uh, will encrypt the data and some of the TCP UDP headers. So when this part goes over the public internet, uh, even if the attacker can see certain parts of it, it may not be able to make any sense of the data. Now over the public network, when, when this IP packet traverses through many routers and reaches um, the enterprise networks, um, gateway router. The gateway router from the protocol flag field will recognize that IPsec is in use. So it will strip everything and recreate the vanilla IP header, uh, which is used without security. And that gets inside the network to the destination, for example, a server. So this is a simple scenario to demonstrate how IPsec can be employed in a particular use case. So uh, basically, IPsec is very comprehensive and it can do a lot more. So in previous example, we saw it could achieve data confidentiality, but it can also achieve integrity, origin, and prevent things like replay attack. Uh, this protocol is quite complex and there are many, many modes. So it supports one mode called tunneling mode and another mode called transport mode of operation. And what we saw in the previous picture was basically a transport mode here. So this is a transport mode. In tunneling mode, say for example, there could be another organization here, which will have an IPsec compliant router. So everything will come to this router as vanilla IP, plain IP, and then this router will do the encapsulation and a tunnel will be established between these two routers, which will you then use tunnel mode so everyone else does not need to implement IPsec, like these hosts and these hosts don't. So that's the advantage of uh, tunnel mode. So um, in tunneling mode, the endpoint of tunnels could be a source or an edge router, as uh, I demonstrated in the previous example. And uh, this is uh, usually a popular choice you typically implement it at edge devices so that uh, all the users are free from installing this IPsec software. The other advantage of using um, the tunnel mode at the edges is that only the two edge devices will need to negotiate keys. It can be even manually installed by the sysadmin people. So that uh, removes the need for any complex key negotiation protocol. Well, as you know, networking is a discipline where you have to deal with a lot of different type of acronyms. And uh, here, when we are adding security, we have 
more acronyms to learn. So IPsec has a whole bunch of its own acronyms. There is one mode called um, Encapsulation Security Payload, ESP, and that's one of the formats that uh, supports confidentiality, uh, whereby the IP packets are encrypted. It also provides integrity using hashing that we've learned earlier and source authentication. Now, there could be a case where application doesn't need confidentiality, then they can use another mode called authentication header AH. And that format will just provide integrity and source authentication. In fact, uh, this AH is kind of redundant because you can achieve the same thing by using ESP. And uh, there is RFC which says that if you use null encryption, then it can achieve the same objective. So by using this ESP and AH and then tunnel and transport mode, there are four different possible uh, combinations that you can use here. So the VPN tunnels typically are fully encrypted and the tunnel mode with ESP um, is uh, the protocol of choice. So if you were to do anything with configuring routers with this uh, VPN security, then this is uh, something that you should consider. Now, given that we are talking about security here, IPsec is state-oriented protocol. It maintains certain state. And uh, there is a term called security association. Uh, basically, it's a data structure which keeps some information about uh, communication going in each direction. And that is kept in a database called SAD. Uh, what a name. And uh, typically, when a communication belongs a packet comes, it will check uh, uh, in the table as to which essay it belongs to, and then we'll look at, oh, what kind of encryption it uses, integrity check uses, what kind of authentication key it uses, and all that information. And that's then implemented to do the encapsulation. Now, for simplistic cases, like establishing tunnel between two points, you could pre-configure it, manually do it, make a phone call. But when large number of devices are to be configured with key, then there is a protocol call Internet Key Exchange Protocol, and the current version is two. And uh, that uses uh, a standard protocol to negotiate keys. Uh, they establish what is called this key seed. This is similar to the master key that we saw earlier. So you've got this master key first, and then the, you generate a whole bunch of session keys, uh, similar to what we learned in T TLS. As I said before, Like that's a very good way of providing extra security and perfect forward secrecy so that between sessions, same keys are not used. Now, we, we focus mainly on IP because that's the dominant protocol, but there are some other bits and pieces which helps with security. So with IPv4 address space running out, uh, NAT, network address translation devices became quite popular. And uh, these devices also help with security. Why? Because uh, Internal addresses, like the private addresses, are not exposed to outside world because the NAT box translates and exposes only uh, a visible IP address to outside world. So they don't know which server they are talking to. There is less information to be derived for atta attackers. Then you have IPv6 efforts, and they provide a whole bunch of uh, mechanisms which results in good security. Like a 120-bit address uh, space, it makes the search um, any of the tools which are uh, searching for IP addresses and so forth uh, to do a lot more work. The other good thing is that uh, layer 3 addresses are derived directly from layer 2 addresses, uh, and they don't need ART protocol. Uh, we'll talk briefly about ART protocol, but that's one of the areas where a lot of attacks do happen. And then there are ways of uh, generating these cryptographically generated CGA addresses. Um, which binds to public key signature and brings all those uh, public key related security features that we talked about earlier. So initially IPsec was uh, uh, mandated, but now it's just recommended for IPv6. So we talked about uh, IP and IP masquerading and IPv6, but uh, let's talk about um, routing protocol security. Um, I must say that in initial versions of the IGP protocols, like interior gateway protocols, which work within the autonomous system, 
they don't have any security by default. And uh, there were some options of configuring them uh, based on um, just uh, integrity checks, MD5 uh, based authentication and uh, uh, plain text based protocols. In these systems, typically the routers exchange message digest and key ID. So if you have a table, then the key ID tells you which password to use from that key. So these are pretty rudimentary sort of uh, security mechanisms. While we are talking about network layer security, it's important to actually have a brief talk about BGP protocol. So this is a protocol which is exchanged between exterior gateways so that uh, packets from one autonomous can go through the autonomous other autonomous systems. And uh, they exchange and build the uh, table uh, without doing any authentication, unfortunately. And that has resulted in many, many types of attacks, like one is called BJP route hijack, hijacking, whereby all traffic can be diverted to a particular network. So for example, a malicious network which wants to capture an eavesdrop might uh, do this attack whereby everything can be seen in, uh, by their routers. DOS attack is another type of attack in BJP whereby just you take down a BJP router like any other server. So um, th these problems have resulted in some effort in coming up with security solutions like BJP set. And they are recommending basically use of PKI so that you don't accept uh, routes from the peers without making sure that it's uh, verified. Uh, again, like any verification comes at a cost and especially in core routers where a lot of information gets exchanged that can result in uh, bottleneck in terms of processing. So now it's time for us to move down to link layer and uh, link layer is a very big area and there are many, many different ways uh, to provide security. So we'll look at a couple of uh, major issues in securing link layer and, and what are the types of mechanisms used. So first one is 802.1x port based authentication. And then security issues in Ethernet switch LAN. I'll briefly go through that. Um, and then security issues in wireless LAN. So these are the three topics we'll cover here. So if we look at uh, the port-based authentication, that's applicable for both wired and wireless network. And again, with any standards, they come up with their own nomenclature. So uh, a station typically is called supplicant, and that must authenticate with a switch or a access point here. Um, this is called authenticator. And uh, the authenticator is connected to, say, uh, an authentication server using typically wired network. In many cases, uh, the authentication server and authenticator can be co-located in the same device. So if you look at this uh, network here, it uses a bunch of protocols. On one side, you're using um, the 802.11, for example, and uh, there is a protocol called EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, for authentication by AS through the authenticator. So you basically have AS connected to authenticator. And before you communicate, your device has to talk to authenticator, which in turn talks to the AS and make sure that the user has um, authorization to use the network. So there are two sides of this. One side is using these protocols, EAP over LAN. And the other side can be traditional IP network using UDP IP. And this server can be implemented using many different technologies like RADIUS and LTAP and so forth. So um, how does this whole thing work? Basically, initially, when a device wants to connect to Ethernet switch, whether it's wired or wireless, it won't be able to send any high, higher layer protocols. It will be able to send only to, to that one x traffic. And so when when it co communicates with say a switch the switch will ask for eap request whereby identity of the supplicant is requested and uh, the supplicant will then supply this information typically its username and hash of password which gets tunneled to the as 
So in the previous example, you don't communicate to AS directly. The authenticator, either through a co-located AS or to, through UDP protocol, will communicate with AS. And AS will check whether you have already got uh, your details in the system or not. So you must have an account with uh, your organization before you can use the network. And it will give one of these results. And if uh, the result is accept, then authenticator will unlock the port and higher layer protocols can get to. And uh, once the supplicant or the user logs off through this message, then that port gets blocked. So every time you log in, you, you will have to get these credentials checked and authorized. So um, because security is of prime concern, um, there are a bunch of protocols to ensure that eavesdroppers can't get the information. And the EAP uses tunnel for authentication and authorization. So there are different variations of this called EAP TLS, EAP for GSM network, EAP SIM, EAP protected mode. And EAP TLS, if you can guess, it is very similar to the TLS protocol that you have learned earlier. So we'll skip through this, not go through the details here. So once the supplicant and uh, AS, which is the server which keeps your credential, they mutually authenticate, they together generate a master key called PMK, pairwise master key. And in that case, the AS also sends this PMK to the authenticator. So if we go back to the previous foil, so we can see that uh, the AS will install this PMK uh, upon authentication being confirmed. And from this point onward, then the authenticator doesn't need to go back to AS for everything. They can directly communicate with the device. So basically, a whole bunch of keys are derived between, say, the authenticator and the user, very similar to what you have seen in TLS to make sure that in each direction, encryption and integrity check is performed. So Ethernet switches are very widely and popularly used, and uh, they can be prone to many types of attacks. Uh, I must say that uh, a lot of these attacks are pretty much done in the research community because uh, typically the switches may remain in more secure sort of facility. So, But nevertheless, as a designer of any system, you must be aware of security protocols and not assume that physical protection is provided. So one is called switch poisoning attack, where the attacker fills up the switch table with bogus MAC addresses, forcing switch to broadcast all the frames to all outgoing ports, which means like if you're listening somewhere, you will get the packet which is not intended to you. Uh, I guess one needs to understand a bit of uh, um, working of the Ethernet switch to understand these attacks. So I'll just very quickly skim through the type of attacks, but I recommend that you go through some networking book to see how these switch tables are built. Mac spoofing is uh, another attack which uses a legitimate user's MAC address by snooping and flooding the network, uh, which means you can also direct all the traffic to yourself um, or, or target it to a machine so that uh, that gets sort of a denial of service. ARP spoofing, like uh, this is a, a, a major problem whereby a lot of uh, MITM and other type of attacks are happening due to exploiting the weaknesses of ARP protocols, address resolution protocol. So attacker sends fake ARP messages which will bind the target's IP to its own MAC address, which means uh, uh, it will start to uh, receive information which was intended for some other target. Uh, it could also be launched by, uh, it could be used to launch a DOS attack, for example. So um, you can populate the ARP table with multiple IP addresses that correspond to a single MAC address, which means you are diverting everything to a particular machine. Now, the current generation of Ethernet switches provide VLANs. VLANs allows you for segregating um, different segments of net, your network. So for example, your human resources segment doesn't talk to marketing and so forth. Uh, but there are certain weaknesses in VLAN which can be exploited. And uh, there are some attacks uh, like switch spoofing attack or double tagging attack. Again, like you will need to understand um, how these um, tagging protocols work and how these trunking and other facilities work in VLAN environment to be able to understand the details of these attacks. And um, I'll provide references so interested viewers can um, look at those references. 
So again, this table gives you the different type of possible attacks and what are the countermeasures for each of these type of attacks. So for example, if you wanted to stop Mac spoofing, then you can do the port-based authentication that we learned earlier, which means nothing will get through until um, a server checks whether you are authenticated to use the network. Uh, ARP spoofing, for example, limit number of per port addresses. So um, if you also, if you are doing any binding, then you want to make sure that you verify using some sort of a trusted mechanism. So let's talk about wireless LAN security. Uh, most of us use wireless LAN pretty much every day in our lives. So the first protocol which was designed in 90s was called Wireless Equivalent Privacy, WEP. Now, this protocol is defunct, pretty much no one is using it. Um, the reason I had put it in the K is that this is a nice protocol to study to see how not to design a secure protocol. And so it's got good pedagogical value if you're teaching a group of students or if you are learning to design protocols. So the objective was to provide integrity, confidentiality, and authentication and use symmetric key encryption to do that. So they use a 24-bit initialization vector um, that is combined with a 104-bit shared key, typically pre-installed shared key, for example, and fed into a pseudo random number generator. So that creates a stream, uh, which is basically the bits that you are going to use uh, to XOR the plain text and CRC, which is cyclic redundancy check, pretty much uh, used for integrity in the web protocol. We'll talk a bit about that later. And also it uses new IP for each frame, and the IP itself is sent in plain text. So when the receiver receives uh, the IV and it already has shared secret because it's been pre-installed or pre-negotiated, it does the same process and it will get a stream which it XORs and gets the data which was encrypted earlier by the sender. As I said before, the data integrity is used, uh, sorry, data integrity is achieved by using a 32-bit CRC and authentication is used 128-bit nodes. So, as I said before, the interesting part of this protocol is to know why it failed. And there were a number of design flaws. Uh, so very quickly, it became obvious that 24-bit IV, which is 16 million unique con combinations, can be exhausted in less than a few hours in high-speed lands. And so the attacker could mount a known plain text attack as IVs are sent in plain text in this case. There was another problem called the FMS attack. Uh, that's after these um, scientists Fleur, Martin, and Shamir. And uh, what they do is that uh, if they capture a large number of messages, they can recover the keys. And that was uh, inherent weakness in this RC4 scheme. Also, the CRC, cyclic redundancy check, which is a great algorithm for finding errors in the communication link, is not a good um, algorithm to be used for uh, integrity check because it's fairly easy to rearrange the message and reproduce a matching MAC. And so a man in the middle attack can happen fairly easily. So these are some of the things that you learn that how you do not design a protocol. So since these problems were discovered, a number of measures were taken, and I'm going to very quickly go through the overview of it. You can find more in the K and in other literature. So obviously they extended, sorry, extended uh, the IV to 48 bits, so it's uh, a lot longer. Uh, they came up with some other key integrity protocol. However, in the initial phases, they wanted to be backward compatible with the existing uh, wireless uh, routers. Now, rather than using the pre-shared key straight away, they add it with nonce and hash it to generate a temporal key. And then this temporal key is used in conjunction with the transmitter's MAC address and sequence number counter and goes through a crypto function. 
which generates 128-bit key. So it kind of complicates things because you know the FMS attack and all was easy to launch uh, with this um, pseudo random number generator used in WEP. So it also achieves the forward secrecy in the sense that each packet is encrypted with a unique encryption key because same key is not used multiple times. Then uh, there were improvements like WPA2 came in 2004 and it uh, used uh, this 128-bit AES mode called CCMP, which is counter mode with cipher blockchain message authentication protocol. Again, like if you're not sure, just uh, refer to some of the references uh, on how these mechanisms work. And uh, obviously it improved the security by having a temp temporal key generation process uh, and uh, uh, improved secure four-way handshake, very similar to TLS type mechanism that we saw earlier. Then WPA3 came and uh, in large organizations like typically pre-shared key manual installation wouldn't work. So it allowed for key, key distribution mechanism called SAE. And that was based on efforts IETF efforts called Dragonfly Key Exchange. So there were certain uh, recommendations, the personal version used 128-bit key for encryption, and what the enterprise version used 192-bit encryption. There is another term used in literature for wireless and security called robust security network, and that made things even further sort of uh, more solid in terms of security by using the port-based mechanism that we talked about earlier, to dot one x and EAP that we talked about uh, in key generation. Also, it uh, maintained the TKIP and CCMP that we just talked about. So it achieves basically the encryption, integrity, and origin authentication. So the key generation ideas are very similar. Typically, you start with some sort of shared key master key and then generate multiple keys for a session so that on both sides you can use uh, different keys. And uh, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, you can look at uh, these mechanisms here. Mm -hmm. The next foil, uh, this particular foil has a good picture of how different keys in uh, enterprise or, or, or <coughs> sorry, uh, a, a larger key, mm -hmm. which is uh, used through key distribution can be used to generate the PMK, which then uses the PR function with various ingredients to make it more complex and uh, pairwise transition keys used. And that gets diced and sliced into various components to use confirmation key for control messages, encryptions, and other temporal keys are used. Again, this is required only if you are going to um, manage these networks. But generally speaking, you take home the message that uh, RSN provides a fairly robust and complicated set of mechanisms to achieve security in wireless LAN environment, borrowing some ideas uh, of the port-based uh, security that we talked about. So in this last segment, I will talk about network defense tools. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a separate uh, knowledge area, KA, on um, operations and management, and that actually deals with this topic much more in detail, but it's important that we touch upon this for completeness of uh, network security. So we'll very quickly go through like packet filters, firewalls, application gateway, circuit level gateway, and IDS and IPS systems. So uh, one of the very early network defense tools were packet filters and firewalls, and there are two varieties. One is called stateless, the other one is stateful. So stateless are very simple. They are looking at each packet without looking at the flow session information, etc. Whereas the stateful will maintain the state, try to correlate uh, packets for a flow, and uh, it will result in better outcome, but needs extra resources because you're keeping state. So they would use a set of rules to inspect each packet and perform some matching action. So for example, Based on the rules, they can let the packet go, or they will drop the packet. 
uh, in some cases you want notifications so as they drop the packet they will be notified and packets can be filtered based on variety of um, criterion like uh, the source destination ip addresses different protocol types and flag bits and so forth then we have application gateway or sometimes also called application proxies and uh, they can get some higher layer information they can perform access control through user authentication they can inspect the information on full five layers of stack that we talked about how do we implement it where it's kind of uh, a choice you can make could be co-located with the firewall or it can uh, work uh, separately in conjunction with the firewall so basically it can create two sessions one is between the client and the ag and the second is between ag and the destination that goes through the firewall so it kind of separates so that for the outside world they have to go through this ag they cannot reach the internal hosts in the network the other use is when you are using ssl you can terminate a ssl connection so this ag does all the heavy lifting so all encryption decryption is done by the ag and it can provide the vanilla ip traffic to servers that can result in better the ages can also inspect encrypted outbound traffic um, whether clients are configured with the corresponding certificates installed at the ag so you can see that uh, you can remove certain uh, tasks uh, which are done by typical servers in order to achieve security uh, nothing is free in terms of security so if you are implementing ag you are installing extra delay in your path and uh, because you're looking at authentication you're doing policy checks you're maintaining certain tables for flows and so forth the other term that is very similar to ag is called circuit level gateway and uh, this is uh, typically a proxy that functions as a relay for tcp connection so basically it allows the host from a corporate internet to make tcp connections over the internet and uh, it can do some checks and bounds uh, one of the implementations that is widely used is called SOX, and uh, it runs transparently as long as you can configure your host to be using SOX interface so in terms of uh, the features it's very similar to application gateway if you like because you're not letting the host from the network to communicate to our side world directly they have to go through this circuit level Yet with the name circuit level comes because of the connection orientation of TCP. So these days for security, every organization typically would be using some sort of intrusion detection system. And the IDS uh, can vary in terms of their capabilities. Typically they would do deep packet inspections. So they will look at multiple feeds. Um, they will deploy several agents, sensors and monitors in different places in the network at the host. Uh, typically a copy of all the incoming traffic is supplied to an IDS for analysis and it can compare it against what is considered normal traffic and if there is something uh, unusual then it will set up. So there are two main categories. Uh, one is signature based and the other one is anomaly based and also the classification sometimes is uh, based on where they are deployed. So they can be host based or they can be network based so let's look at a signature based ids typically they would have a database of signatures of known problems very similar to viruses and uh, when they analyze the traffic they will try to see if anything is matching with a signature if it does then it sets an alarm these systems are known to have many false negatives uh, because the database can be outdated. Also, it can generate heavy workload because it's doing a lot of signature matching and depending on the size of database, it can uh, take away. The other problem is that uh, they will not be able to detect uh, new types of attacks if they are not in the database, which is quite obvious. Now, in contrast, the anomaly-based IDS will use some sort of statistical feature of normal traffic and then they will compare it against say the monitor traffic 
So for example, bandwidth consumption or arrival rate or burstiness, if they start to look suspicious, then you know that there is something happening It's worth uh, monitoring the system. Um, a large number of port scans, for example, this is what a lot of attackers will do, uh, would uh, raise some alert that, okay, someone is uh, trying to scan your network and possibly would like to attack. Again, like uh, this has been an active area of work and with the popularity of machine learning and AI techniques, people have come up with many, many different ideas, but still they suffer from the problem of false positives. So in terms of network uh, and host-based uh, ideas, basically there is nothing much to it except that it depends on where you are implementing these functionalities. So host-based are very similar to the virus scanning type program that will monitor network traffic, what's going in and out. And network-based means you will kind of put a few devices around different segments of network to monitor activities. Now, finally, let's talk about uh, one of the other type of tool in network defense called intrusion prevention system. Um, they differ from IDS in the sense that they try to stop attacks from happening. So intrusion detection typically would passively try to analyze the traffic and raise alert. But IPS can be configured so that if they detect a problem, um, they can take action. For example, they can drop uh, packets if they see that there is some sort of DOS attack happening. So all of these IPS would have ideas you need to detect before you can do any action. So, um, if you detected that, okay, certain type of traffic seems to be attacked, then you can um, create a trigger so that uh, the filter will start to capture uh, packets belonging to that flow and drop those ones. In addition, like some higher layer protection can also be achieved by these IPS systems. For example, they could do mail scanning, which means they will have to access, have access to the full protocol stack. They could look at, say, for example, um, some type of spams or, or um, uh, other type of, uh, say, virus scanning uh, in, in terms of attachments and so forth. Uh, the problem is that none of these systems are perfect. They come with some baggage, for example. Um, they certainly would slow down things, result in false positives. So you could uh, alert the system unnecessarily for uh, things which are not malicious. Uh, let's uh, very quickly talk about the network security architecture design. So we saw that uh, security needs to be done at many levels and uh, you can use IDS, IPS tools and all, but uh, um, a network architect or a security architect uh, must uh, analyze the network and try to configure things uh, based on the complexity of the network and the importance of uh, particular areas of business. Uh, a common practice is to use something called DMZ, demilitarized zone. Um, it is a zone where you put all the servers which are going to face externally, that is communicate to outside world. So you protect rest of your internal net network and uh, devices and services from being exposed to the outside world. There is a, a DMC, all these servers are there, so anything which comes from outside goes through these servers. And then you put some of these uh, IDS, IPS uh, systems in this uh, zone to make sure that you're monitoring them closely. So towards the end, we'll look at some advanced security topics and you would have heard of software defined networking, which has been quite popular in the last five, six years. So in earlier, architecture, each of the routers would be doing both control and forwarding functions. So what SDN did is basically separate these two functions. So there is a forwarding function which is done in cheaper off-the-shelf off devices. And then there is a controller which is like a centralized sort of uh, uh, intelligent uh, place where all these uh, routing functions and all are calculated. So that's the basic idea about uh, SDN. And this technology now brings uh, certain interesting aspects of, of providing security more proactively because you have a centralized intelligent place. So it can proactively monitor and take actions. For example, if DDoS is happening, it can 
quickly configure the forwarding planes to make sure that they drop these packets early. So um, STN has been a fairly active area of research. I provided some survey on STN security as a reference. You may like to read a lot more on this topic. One of the challenges with STM is that the platform itself can be prone to attacks because it's a new type of architecture. Uh, one typical example is like timing side channel attacks. So um, an attacker can observe the behavior and see how uh, IDS and a database are communicating and infer information like which websites are being visited. So there are some countermeasures proposed in literature that is uh, implementing artificial delays and all. Uh, being a newer technology, I'm not entirely sure how much of these attacks are happening in real-world deployment, but as researchers, uh, we've looked at uh, all sorts of possible attacks to help uh, produce a robust set of technology for future. Uh, the other area is network function virtualization, and uh, there is a trend to deploy network middle boxes like firewalls, DMZ, load balancers, and so forth as virtualized software models called VNFs. And then you manage these through APIs. Now, the thing is that they may be running on a common resource and a common server. So if you manage to sneak into one of the VNFs, uh, you could actually uh, potentially change configuration of the whole network and do a lot more damage. So um, the flexibility comes with a bit of baggage and there is again a lot of uh, interest in looking at security aspects of the NFPs. And uh, finally, uh, I'll be concluding this talk with uh, Internet of Things. So we were talking about IP network and Internet of Things is pretty much connecting any device of any sort, doing all kind of sensing and actuation functions to the internet. And um, there has been uh, a bit of a rush to be first to the market. So um, the bar to entry is fairly low. Anyone can assemble a bunch of sensors and put a processor and a communication chip and build these devices. So people are more interested in coming up with new features and functionalities and security comes as a second thought. So that's why like a lot of researchers have been typically looking at security issues of IoT devices, finding vulnerabilities. We've already talked about Mirai DDoS attack, which happened due to the IoT cameras being captured. Now, in terms of security, there is a recommendation to use public key, but sometimes this can be resource intensive. Uh, there is a recommendation by some consortiums to use DTLS, which is uh, a a datagram TLS, so lightweight version of TLS if you like, but then that doesn't scale because it's good for only point-to-point -point communication and a lot of uh, IoT, you may have broadcast kind of environment whereby you want to program multiple devices or download code images to update uh, the firmware and so forth. So it remains a fairly interesting area and I provided again many references for interesting view interested viewers to read. So I hope like you got a fairly quick uh, and brief overview of the network security issues. Um, this is a fairly complex topic. I've tried to cover these things in less than an hour or so. Um, as you can imagine, like uh, the topic is covered in several textbooks. So uh, I hope that gets you interested and started with network security. All the best.